I'm very excited to be here, and today I want to talk with you about how we can bring animations to the web. What you could, should go home with after this talk is actually to have a better understanding of where animations are coming from and how the history looks like. Also, which tools and APIs you can actually currently use to transport animations to the web today, and how we can create our own animated components in Ember.js to actually leverage and create these animations today. And before we get into the full topic, I want to shortly yeah, tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, for example, what I currently do for work. And here I actually have the really great joy to also work with Ember on a day-to-day -day basis, which is really great, when, uh, with a company that is called Leadfeeder, which offers an online lead generation tool for sales teams to better understand who visits the website and how they can help their customers. Also, what is interesting for me is what I actually do after work. And uh, I'm from Berlin. Here in the background, you can see the very beautiful uh, Alexander Tower. And what I like to do here is enjoy the um, vegetarian alternative cuisine of the city. Portland should also be very famous for that, so I'm looking forward to this this week. Um, also, I'm a big fan of art, and I like to draw myself. And what I also like to do is engage in the tech scene in Berlin. So I'm one of the co-mentors and organizers of different workshops of Open Text Superlean, which tries to offer free access to learning resources about technologies. And also just recently I started with two other Ember uh, developers based in Berlin, uh, Clemens Müller and Joschka Kinscher, to relive our um, Ember Berlin Jazz meetup. So if you ever happen to be in town and actually want to say hi, please do so. We would be really happy to see you there. But there's also a really great passion of mine that brings us much closer to the topic of this actual talk, and this is cartoons. Since I was a kid, I really liked cartoons, as probably many others of you as well. And if we think about animations and cartoons on a more abstract level, we realize this is nothing else than actually animations that we see on television or in the cinema. And the interesting part about this is we as developers actually think about so many other different things when it comes to animations. We might think about something like UI elements that have a specific animations one we, once we hover over um, a button that we just created for our web app. Or we might think about something like smooth page transitions with Ember Liquid Fire, which we already saw in the former talk. Also, what comes to our mind are things like data visualizations with SVG, so this is something that also helps our users to better understand what is happening in a web app that we're building. And by the way, if you're interested in this specific topic, I highly recommend you to check out Jane Weber's talk on SVG animations interactions tomorrow. But summing this up, all these elements that we can describe under the category of informative UX, so everything that informs our users actually what is happening on the website and where they should be heading, is something that I won't talk about today. Today I want to talk with you about how we can create stories and actually tell narratives on the web using animations. So with that said, let's maybe have a look what an animation is actually consisted of. How can we actually define an animation and what are the basics of actually creating traditional animations? Probably the most well-known and very first example of classic animation, like frame-by-frame -frame animation, is what we see here in the background. It's a sequence of images taken by the photographer, Edward Mulbridge, already in the um, end of the 19th century, in which he, in very strenuous work actually, had to take 12 different images of a rider uh, riding on a horse along the Palo Alto track, and he would collect these images, put them onto a disk and a specific device that he could use back then in the 19th century to actually create animations. And here's a reconstruction that you can see of this kind of like impression that you get looking through this device, that if we see these images in rapid succession, it seems as if this rider on the horse is actually literally riding uh, along the cross the track, although it's just a composition of different still images. If we 
uh, take a look at this example, realize an animation is not much, any, much more than just the sequence of images that is shown in a specific frequency, and it would later on create the illusion of motion to us. And this effect is something that is not inherently um, the um, essence of animation itself, it's something that actually is mostly powered by our brain. And what our brain actually does is, it has a specific resolution for like changes in our visual perception and um, an, interesting, um, an interesting work by a psychologist called Max Wertheimer described this phenomenon as a fee phenomenon and he realized that with images that we see that um, has been, have been shown in a certain delay that is lower than 200 milliseconds or um, optimally around 60 milliseconds, it will give us this illusion that there are not two distinct images, there's actually a motion between these two images that we see. And this is quite interesting. You can use this actually to create animations just by still images that we show in this certain time frame delayed. So with that said, you might think now, okay, this is like 150 years ago. How is this relevant to us today? But the good thing is the story of animations continues until today. And we as developers might find really interesting, can we also bring this to our most loved platform that we know, actually the platform of the web? And yes, actually we can do. And in the next part, I want to show you which kind of tools and APIs can be currently used and have been really vividly used in the past to achieve this. There's, there's really no pun intended, right? But probably many of you here in the audience can still vividly remember that there was a specific tool used for over a decade to create animations on the web and you might also still remember when its first release was, which was actually literally 20 years ago. In the end of 1969, the first release of Flash was out. And this kind of like multimedia platform enabled us to create games, animations, many other multimedia content and also deliver it to the web. But as many of as you know, the popularity for Flash decreased Many developers abstained for actually still implementing that in their websites. And they were, yeah, kind of like shifting to another space where you were like, okay, we can't really use this anymore. There's a lot of controversy around security issues with this platform. And also the browser support is not really given because vendor browsers opted out of still supporting that. But luckily, already quite a while ago, but in 2014, really officially accredited by the W3C, um, we have a new hero on the horizon. And as, oh, as many of you know, now, now I already got it away, um, this hero is called HTML5, that's right. And with HTML5 you get a lot of these very lovely things that we used to do and to create in Flash. Um, also out of the box we get like video elements, we get access to an audio API, and also we get animations just out of the box implemented for us to use and create new features on the browser. If I talk about HTML5 animations, um, I use the term very loosely, so although the HTML5 spec is very specific to certain features uh, around the specification, I will also include all the cool features that we get from CSS3. I will also include open source JavaScript libraries that are based on HTML5 specifications and many others that I cannot really go into further depth in this talk, but um, just to yeah, give a short um, uh, summary of what we can use, we realize there are many things out there that can be used to create open web standard powered animations. And the big advantage of open web standards is obviously that they are open. This actually means for us developers we actually have insight in how the specifications are made and we might even have the power to influence how they are further progressing in the future. What we also get is a certain consistency. As these technologies mature over different browsers over the years, we realize the features that we build now on these open web standards will play for a very long time into the future. 
we get a lot of reliability in our code and realize this is something that is meant to last. And also, the really great thing is because the web is so omnipresent, we can actually reach our users with the animations we create based on these open web standards on any device, anytime, anywhere we want. So there are a lot of advantages around this concept of embracing open web standards to create content and specifically animations. And interestingly, with uh, regard to other things that we used before, for example, Flash to create animations, you might think, what about, what about actually about the experience for all the people that ha don't have a really strong background in programming? People who are maybe not so familiar with the web as a platform and that really love to use graphic user interfaces to create the content and also tell the stories that they um, used to tell in the past. And if we have a look at that, we um, here might kind of further investigate how this actually unfolds and in this regard, I found a really, really powerful quote by Regina Bors, an award-winning cartoonist and also web animations advocate in the community. And she is talking about the concept of an endless canvas, which kind of describes the possibility to create animations and tell stories on this almost endless possibilities that we have on the web. And she describes her transition from coming from traditional media to actually create cartoons and stories to the web as very empowering because she realized that all the new specs that were coming out, especially like HTML5 specs, were actually quite approachable to her, although she was not really familiar with the technologies behind it, but she was really keen to try them out. And to yeah, give you an understanding of what we're actually talking about and actually doing something with Ember in this talk as well, Let's maybe have a specific look at, yeah, a demo, something that is actually also based, very similar call to um, a canvas, um, especially, uh, specifically the HTML5 canvas API used in Ember. The HTML5 canvas element is an um, element that we can just drop into our um, HTML. It comes with the canvas tag. And what we gain from that is actually the access to a very powerful web API that we can use for many, many things. So if you're, for example, interested in WebGL, you might already be familiar with it, but we can also do traditional frame-by-frame -frame animations with that. So that's pretty exciting. So let's have a look at that. The Canvas context object is very crucial for understanding how we can actually achieve this. The context object is something like our toolbox once we actually get a reference to the HTML element that contains the canvas, we can then get the context object with the get context method. And once we have this, we can actually draw on the canvas, we can set colors and background um, images to the canvas and get all the great things from the API. And what is also interesting to note here, the browser support for HTML5 canvas and the, um, yeah, I would say, Basic, um, basic features from that are, have a really great browser support, so this might not really be relevant to you unless you still have like users relying on ES7 or E8 or something, but if you do, it might be worth noting that you might have to polyfill these features or think about a fallback for anything that you do on the canvas. So let's maybe have a look on a yeah, specific example um, how we can actually create an animated component. First of all, we would have to create the component, so we could have a comic panel component, let's call it like that, with a certain width and height. And later on, we could, yeah, just describe the tag name on this component to actually create our HTML element later on once the component renders. Then, interestingly, we would have to think how do we achieve this effect of the frame-by-frame -frame animation we learned that we want to show the certain images of the animation in rapid succession, what we would like to do is first of all create a sprite sheet, so like a collection of different images into one single file, which helps us a lot later on in the web app to actually just load one file and not having to um, reload with several requests, uh, several subfiles for this animation. And what we can do here is think about 
getting certain frames after each other and actually putting them on a specific destination of our canvas element, one after each other. And in the HTML5 Canvas API, we have a really handy draw image method, which enables us with the coordinates of the upper left corner of the, um, of the source image that we want to map and the origin of the uh, canvas space that we want to actually occupy with this image and the width and the length to map this onto the destination of our element. And if we have a look at this, how this might, um, might unfold, we also realize we, where do we actually get the image from, right? So we would first have to load this. And what we can do here is actually create an, yeah, an instance of an image in our Ember component once it's actually initialized. And then we can say, okay, we grab like the height and the width of our sprite because obviously we also want to know where where does the next frame actually start and where does it stop? And we can only deduct this from, yeah, the length of the sprite sheet and also from the number of frames that it actually contains, right? And later on, we would like to, yeah, load this image. And once this actually is done, we set this object instance here in this example called pseudo image um, on, as a property on our component. Then if we move on, we, would also like to actually draw something. Um, uh, also, just as a disclaimer, I, I cannot really go through the full code. So if you realize at some time point, okay, there are some gaps or something, I will also link to the original repo of the demo so you can still look everything up that you're wondering about and also feel free to ask me afterwards. But yeah, if we do this, uh, we create the draw function, we would define all the different coordinates of our sprite sheet and also the canvas object that we want to map to. And what we can do here is, first of all, clear everything that we drawn before. This comes in handy later on if we actually loop through our uh, drawing function, which we have to do to actually create a succession of frames. And then also, we would actually have to draw the image with the draw image function that I explained earlier. And if we do this, we can finally get our context object, we can uh, set a context property that can be reused in other functions in our component as well, and then we can actually draw. And the interesting thing here is as well, we actually want to wait before, until the image has loaded, right, that we preloaded earlier in the initialization, so it might be come in handy to actually wait for that. We can, for example, do this um, with an observer. So with that, with that said, okay, now we have a drawn image to a canvas, okay, cool. Um, I could have just used an image tag for that. We, yeah, we actually want to make it move. So let's do that right now. And um, if you want to run something, uh, there's something really handy that we can use in Ember as well to um, actually iterate over something uh, over and over again. And this is called the um, ember run later method, and here we can actually say, okay, we have a certain function that actually draws everything and clears everything what we've drawn before, and we can uh, call it again and again after 100 milliseconds, which we already realize is a quite a good interval to actually create this illusion of motion to our human eye. And also what we could do is call uh, a function that actually increments our frame number because everything in our drawing function is also dependent on the frame number and will then recalculate which part of the sprite sheet we actually want to map. Um, I won't show it here in this code example, but you can look it up later on in the repo. And also what we have to do if we, yeah, click on the play button later on, it would be cool to maybe also pause it at some time point. I mean, animations are really cool, but they shouldn't be there forever, right? So really simply, we just set a reference to the current run loop as a property on our component, and then later on we can cancel this again uh, at some other part in part of an action. And yeah, if we do that, uh, let's maybe have a look at the demo. So what we can do then is, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, just like play it, and then also pause it. So our raccoon guy finally can jump off the building and actually save a gentleman from getting his hand back picked by a robber, so the day is saved. Cool. 
What's also good to know about HV5 Canvas for you, performance-wise, we get like a lot of advantage by um, not having to rely on DOM objects being loaded in the background to actually create these animations. The HTML5 Canvas MPI is really low level, so this means everything that we do on the Canvas, even if we create a lot of different layers on it, is not powered by specific DOM objects and a lot of like memory in our browser that has to be used up. So this is really good for performance if you do something more heavy, and it's probably also one of the main reasons why WebGL actually relies on HTML5 Canvas. We also get a lot of control as a developers on what's actually happening in our animations, which is also really great. Creator experience-wise, I realize we have to do a lot of kind of like lifting before we get like just uh, six frame animations kind of running and also, yeah, kind of like interactable with us. So I think this is something that might be quite approachable, but maybe also too improved. And also accessibility wise, we realize there are some obstacles we have to jump over to actually make it accessible because we actually just rendering images into a flat object in our browser that doesn't give us access to any kind of attributes that might be used by screen readers or any other accessibility devices. So this is just like a summary. And for getting this in a better context on how we can this compare to other browser APIs, let's have a look at another API that maybe not so many of you might be familiar with, but I would like to know actually, like a hands up, who has ever heard before about the Web Animations API? Like anyone here? Okay, yeah, actually quite a few, cool. So maybe some of the things now will uh, be a bit of repetition for you, but I see a lot of hands didn't go up, so this might be really interesting for some of the people. Yeah, the Web Animations API is something that is quite cutting edge, and um, I believe is actually the animation um, of the future, the future of the animation. And we, yeah, we, we get from this API a lot of like control to actually synchronize animations and also get playback control out of the box, which is really exciting. So we don't have to do any heavy lifting for that. And yeah, if we, if we then think, okay, this is all cool, then let's have a look at the browser support. And then we realize, oh, okay, we go to canaius.com, screenshot is from this morning and realize, well, a lot of red, a bit of olive green, this is not so good, right? A lot of like, this doesn't really work yet, so, okay, that's, that means that's a no, right? We, we can't really use it yet. But luckily, for the Web Animations API, we already have a really, really well-maintained polyfill out there, which is really great, and this actually enables us to use features of the Web Animations API already today to create animations on the web, and also for many features that are not even in this kind of like accepted draft state yet, but just like still in a very kind of like discussionable mode, we even get another really cool uh, web API um, polyfill called the Web Animations Next polyfill. And there's of course also an add-on for that. So you can just install, Ember install, Ember Web Animations Next polyfill, and you get all the kind of features that are currently in draft state out of the box in your application. So let's have a look how, yeah, this looks code-wise. Um, the Web Animations API largely depends on keyframe effects, and keyframe effects, if you look at them, they look really similar to the keyframes you already know from the CSS3 spec, which I think is really cool, because it means if, for example, I'm a designer or someone who's like, very familiar with CSS3, I already kind of know where this is coming from and what this is about, and we also, very similar to the keyframes in CSS, we get that all the keyframes that we list up um, in one single list will be distributed evenly across the animation span. So if I have three, they will all be triggered at time point zero, 33%, and then later on at 100%. So pretty straightforward. We can kind of get our head around that. And yeah, let's have a look how we can actually create also an animated component of that, similar to the example before. If you want to do that, we can first of all have our uh, comic panel component again. Uh, we also create a new sprite sheet that we actually want to animate in this component. And we would actually create the keyframe effects. And for this to happen, we would first of all have to have keyframes defined. We already saw some of them. And what we also need essentially for every animations are 
animation options. So these are the definitions that we usually know from CSS to actually find how long an animation is, what kind of timing function you want to use. Interestingly, for our keyframes animations, we actually don't want to the animation to ease, we actually want to stepwise go through the animation. And we can use this really handy steps function that enables us to just put in the number of frames that we want to show and then later on actually animate through it infinitely as we have defined here. We can pass this in in our comic panel component and once we have actually done that, we can already very easily start our animation with just a few lines of code. Once our component has rendered, we can just say we get all the keyframes, we get all the animation options that we have passed into the component, and the only thing that we now have to call is this element or the, this uh, dollar reference to the element that we're on, and then animate. And this is it. So we already have an animation running out of the box just with this few uh, changes. But interestingly, yeah, this is really not so super exciting because I, I've seen cartoons. Most of the cartoons usually didn't involve the comic character just like running in front of a blank screen. There was stuff going on behind and stuff. So I actually want this as well. So let's, let's have a look how we actually can create multi-layered components. This is also possible with Web Animations API and how would this actually look like? If we want to create several layers, it might make sense to actually create some subcomponents. We could, for example, imagine that we have comic panel layer components that are embedded in our comic panel, and what they could actually do is taking care of binding the keyframes to themselves as elements that should be animated because the Web Animations API is DOM-based, so we just have elements that are animated with the keyframes, and then later on, if we uh, have created this in a comic layer, it could call a frame action that kind of like set these keyframes to the parent component, so the comic panel. And um, just how this looks like to actually create these keyframe effects, we can use the keyframe effect constructor, and this will actually um, curate a keyframe effect that can later, use, uh, can later be used in the Web Animations API to be played back to us. Also in the parent component, the comic panel, we can then very easily, just with a few lines of code, say, okay, we grab the timeline, so a global object in the Web Animations API that lives to give us feedback on which animations are currently running and actually give us access to them to play and pause them. And we can take the key from effects that we already get from our comic layers and later on use the group effect constructor, uh, one of the features, by the way, for which you would actually need the Web Animations Next polyfill. And with this we can say, okay, please group together all of these animations in one single instance, and if I call play or pause or even reverse, this also comes out of the box for the Web Animations API on it, then please do so for all these animations that are embedded in this group effect. This is really great. And what we can then easily do, we yeah, create some actions for it, we create a play action, a pause action. What they do is really simply calling the play and pause method that we get from the Web Animations API, and we're already good to go. This is really fascinating. So yeah, let's just have a look how this looks like. So we have um, a background that is already rendered as a single layer, and then we have a character, and if we yeah, just hit the play button, and if we hit the pause button, we can actually iterate through the different keyframes that we have already provided with the stride sheet, which is really exciting. We can do a lot of more things than that. We can add more layers in the foreground. We could also create single DOM objects that kind of like swirl around the foreground. Just imagine we had some leaves that could also be there, uh, which is quite exciting and pretty straightforward to do if we look at this instance of API. So that's quite exciting. And I really like to um, check it out with this example. What's also good to know with the Web Animation API as a contrast to HTML5 Canvas, we realized that it actually has quite an approachable creator experience. So even if I'm not a JavaScript guru yet, I kind of like understand where everything is coming from and it's very easy to set up once I actually use the polyfill for right now, but it will be even easier in the future. 
Um, I still have lots of developer control. I can define how many objects I actually want to render in my animation, and I can also easily uh, gain access to different ways to animate it with the keyframe effects. And also accessibility-wise, it's really straightforward for us to make this accessible because it's so much powered by DOM. Last but not least, also something to consider. If you would have like thousands of different objects that you want to animate, this might be yeah, quite of like difficult performance-wise compared to HTML5 Canvas at least, because we realize for everything that we try to animate in the Web Animations API, we would have to, yeah, a specific DOM object that is actually created. So um, yeah, it's quite hard to argue about that, but for something that is not too complex, I think it's really still an interesting thing to look into. So yeah, we are we're almost at the end, and let's just like get a conclusion of what we have found with this example that we have looked on so far. So first of all, we realize the story about animations and how we can create and deliver animations is not over. It actually still continues until today, and we have even more than ever tools and methods to actually do this. And yeah, the good thing is, with Ember and also with the power of open web standards, we're actually pretty good to go. And with that said, I would say the endless canvas is actually now yours to be animated, and I'm really looking forward to see what you will create in the future. So thank you very much for your attention, and yeah, have, have, have great fun at EmberConf. Thank you.